what's my why? So uh, Jacob said that I'm a captain of the basketball team, and not only that, but I'm a man on uh, a campus. And typically, when people talk to me about this stuff, I say, why, why are you interested in this? Why are you interested in sexual assault prevention? Um, and it's funny because it really starts off when I was 12 years old uh, and my father passed away in a car accident. So right after that happened, it wasn't like I immediately started getting sexual assault prevention signs and showing them up everywhere. But what it did, what, what it did do is it forced me to think about masculinity. Uh, I didn't have sort of the male figure in front of me at all times to tell me what being a man truly was. Um, and in addition to that, it, it uh, developed a very strong relationship with my mother. Um, and she is very much my um, activist that is pushing me to do, do things, but in a kind of different way. Um, so that thinking and the love of my mother and thinking about my own masculinity um, was the starting step. And then when I came to college, uh, I had a friend who uh, told me about their experience surviving sexual assault. And at the time, I was kind of a hotshot kid who came out of high school, and I won a philosophy award at my school for writing a paper on relativism. So whenever somebody started talking to me about, I'm so defiantly sure that this is right, I always questioned them. Or I'm so defiantly sure that this is wrong, I always questioned them. And what I realized when my friend uh, told me about this story and their pain and the agony and the, the, tear, and the, the tears and the um, difficulty getting words out, if there was one thing that was bad, if there was one thing that was wrong, it was sexual assault. Um, so obviously, my talk would be pretty short if that was all I figured out. So from here, um, what did I do with that? So in the next two years, the past two years, I've been thinking about this. So the first thing that we need to think about is the term prevention and how it differs from advocacy. So at a college, at any sort of institution, you need that baseline. If you don't have a group of people that are advocating for those who survive sexual assault um, and comfort along their journey with getting through that and justice for those who perpetrate it, then that's a problem. And that's the first problem that needs to be fixed. Um, but once that's there, we can fall into a space where we're kind of thinking that advocacy is actually prevention when it's not. And the example that I use is um, the event Taking Back the Night. Taking Back the Night is one of the most powerful, incredible uh, events that happens at, college, at colleges across the country, at communities across the country, um, where people share their experiences or experiences of friends going uh, in their survival with sexual assault. And I was so passionate about this because of my whys. Uh, that I wanted all my friends to come. And I figured that all my friends would be totally down to come. They'd be like, yeah, let's go do that. Um, and what I found is like, I, I kind of got them there. And it was outside. It was like a cold night. And after the first person spoke, they all left. I said, how, how why, like, why, why is everybody leaving? This is like such a humongous issue. Uh, you know, the, like, don't you see how important this is? Uh, and they kind of responded like, dude, this, this is kind of depressing. I don't really want to be here. I'd rather just, I don't know, get dinner or go to bed. Um, and what that made me realize is that we were doing, we, we, that taking back the night in its power, in its advocacy, in its awareness building, it wasn't a measure of preventing sexual assault. Because everybody who was at the event was already extremely uh, engaged and passionate about this movement. And we were losing those who weren't passionate and weren't extremely excited about sexual assault prevention. And in reality, those who are going to pe perpetrate sexual assault are those who are not extremely passionate about sexual assault prevention. So how, how should we think about this? So sexual assault is, like, is an extremely, extremely emotional issue. Um, and when it happens and frustration rises up about it, a lot of times we can't even fathom how somebody could do something like this. And what that results in is a lot of can'ts. So explaining to people, look, this can't be done. This action can't happen. This can't be it. And then, and then in another sense, what should, a very much in like a protective way, we tell people what they should look out for or what they should be nervous about. And what I believe is that when that ground, when that ground level is set, um, when it's clear that 
these things that what you can't do and what you should be afraid of that or what you should you should be protecting yourself from we can reinforce that message in a positive light so in saying that saying and explaining that these are the things you can't do but look here are all the things that you can do here are all the things that you can be excited about and what I've noticed in, with my generation in particular is that we respond a lot more to what is in front of us and what we can do than looking at abstracts and telling people that we can't do those abstracts. So when I think about sexual assault prevention, I think that it's a very dangerous question to ask, how do we make this stop? And it's a very powerful question to ask, how do we make preventing this cool? Which brings me to my next point. So increasing the audience by changing expectations. So it's a reality that these events that many, uh, many of them that I've helped organize, they don't get a lot of people to them. And not only do they not get a lot of people to them, but it's typically the same crowd that keeps coming back and back. And again, I found myself in that frustrating place. Why are there only so many people coming here? Why doesn't everybody see how important this is? And then again, instead of continuing that frustration, looking internally and saying, well, how can we meet people where they are? How can we get more creative with the way that we push the movement for sexual assault prevention? How do, we, how do we make it fun? How do we make people excited to come to it? And the example that I use a lot is uh, I keep a business card around with me from a, uh, from a domestic abuse center in central Maine. And it's a fantastic uh, organization. And it says, if you're, con uh, if you're interested and would like more information, visit our website. And that's fine, but the website is 80 characters long. Now, I consider myself to be somebody who cares about this a lot, but I don't care about it enough to type 80 characters into my keyboard. And that's, that's the point that, is try that, that I'm trying to make, is that in our ability to make this fun, so to make this instead of something that's 80 characters on a keyboard, but merely a click on your computer, we can get a lot more people interested as we're meeting them where they are in their understanding of this stuff. So stopping it at its source is the next point. What I'm doing right now is talking about sexual assault prevention. I don't think that I'm preventing sexual assault right now in this space. So a lot of the work that, that has been done to prevent sexual assault has come in the form of discussions, has come in the form of speakers, has come in the form of forums. Um, and what's, what's that that's doing is it's putting the message out there, yet this isn't the space where sexual assault typically happens. And noticing that, I use a kind of analogy to, uh, with going to the dentist. So when I go to the dentist, the day of, I'm brushing my teeth twice a day, maybe even five times a day, 10 times a day, just, just to make sure that I don't have any cavities. Um, but three weeks down the line, I was like really tired one night. I went to bed without, without brushing. It's not a big deal. Um, and so in a similar, in a similar uh, manner, the next time I went to the dentist, I put a big sign on my mirror in my bathroom. I said, brush your teeth, you lazy person. And so I mix, I, I, in, in my ability to take the message that was given to me by the dentist and inject it into the space where I actually needed to care about my teeth, I became more accountable and I brushed my teeth a lot more. So in the same sense, if we're able to take this message that we, that we hear from speakers, that we hear in discussions, that we hear in forums, and inject them into the spaces where it's most likely to happen, then we're, then we're on to something. Then we're doing something that allows us to, to keep our peers and even ourselves responsible and accountable for the things that we believe in and keeping up integrity. And so finally, uh, the idea of making the message repetitive. So in any system that I've learned um, to try to keep people accountable for their actions, uh, there's three kind of simple rules. And it's have a few rules, number one. Make sure you, as your body, that makes the rule, will never break that, those rules in itself. And then third, repeat them often. So in the same sort of manner, having a speaker come and then having no kind of reinforcement after that is sort of uh, 
just hitting us once and then not repeating it. So in our ability to, to repeat and, and say what our message is constantly, that we're, we're making huge strides. In addition to that, what, where, in the world that we live in now, it's about going viral and being excited about things. And uh, our ability to make this message about sexual assault prevention fun is what's going to attract that um, spiral effect and snowball effect to get more people listening to it and hearing about it. So the point that I like to make in reference again to the business card that I get is that just because it's a fantastic cause that is doing, is, is doing great things for people and spreading great awareness about things doesn't mean we don't have to think about marketing. Doesn't mean that we don't have to meet people where they are and that doesn't mean that we don't have to be creative in the way that we get the message out. And so finally, where will this take us? Now, I'm not saying that uh, rethinking sexual assault prevention is going to uh, totally eradicate sexual assault on college campuses or in high schools. But what I'm saying is that uh, in our ability to take note of these four things that I'm, that I'm talking about here, we'll be able to get everybody's ears. And once we get everybody's ears, we can then explain to them our whys, our reason. Why, why did we put on this event that, was, that they enjoyed but also supported this great cause. And when we have their ears and then we explain their whys, we're very easy, it's, it's very easy to hit their emotions. And when we hit their emotions, then they have their own why. Then they have their own reason for being passionate about this whole entire movement. And, then, and when we have more people passionate about it, it will make our mission to eradicate sexual assault from college campuses and high schools and hopefully the world uh, that much easier. Thank you.